This is Thinking in Public, a program dedicated to intelligent conversation about frontline theological and cultural issues with the people who are shaping them. I'm Albert Moeller, your host and president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Andrew Roberts is a renowned historian. He's the author of several best-selling histories, a history of World War II, biographies of figures such as Lord Halifax and Winston Churchill, even, of course, Napoleon Bonaparte and others. He's an historian of wide range, and he's also an historian of enormous ability. I've had conversations with Andrew Roberts on Thinking in Public before about books including his History of World War II, Storm of War. Today, I'm going to be talking with Andrew Roberts about his latest book, Leadership in War, Essential Lessons from Those Who Made History. Andrew Roberts, welcome to Thinking in Public. Thank you very much indeed, Albert. It's uh, great to be back on the show. You know, I have uh, enjoyed all of your books. Uh, If there's any one genre of literature to which I first turn, it's, uh, it's history and especially historical biography. So you've kind of written a mother load uh, of work over the course of the last several decades, uh, all the way from Halifax and Salisbury to uh, Churchill and uh, Napoleon, and uh, now Leaders in War. I I want to talk about your your newest book, Leadership in War, but I also want to talk about historical biography, how you do it, uh, how how you see it. Uh, And I guess I want to start out by uh, asking you about uh, a central premise of the introduction of your book, and that is that uh, no matter how great a prime minister of Luxembourg may be, uh, outside the context of war and uh, with, uh, with world history at stake, it's very hard for a leader to emerge as a world consequential leader. Yes, I think that's probably a little bit unfair to Luxembourg, but nonetheless, um, I can't think of any peacetime prime ministers of Luxembourg uh, who are going to um, have chapters dedicated to them in books on statesmanship. You really, I think, need to have something uh, that's akin to a uh, national crisis. And um, and war, obviously, is the worst national crisis that can befall a nation. And so, yes, I, I, I do stand by that. I'm afraid it doesn't say very much about the human condition, uh, does it? But um, nonetheless, I do think that for a really... A great statesman from a minor country. Of course, that's not the case with the United States, for example, but from a minor country, uh, you really do have to um, have gone through uh, through the fire. Yes, and a fire of consequence, uh, because Luxembourg is, uh, is a, a dignified country. It uh, has a dignified history. And uh, far more than most people outside of Europe, or perhaps even outside of Luxembourg, would understand. But the leaders that you have chosen to profile in your book on leadership in war, uh, they were not only tried in the crucible of the crisis of war, they also played a role on the history. Uh, they also played a role on the uh, historical stage that affected far more than their own country. I mean, there's a sense in which looking at every one of these chapters. How this story turns out has a great deal to do with how you and I live and in our respective countries and and many other countries of the world. War has, lamentably, been one of the most important shaping uh, energies of history. And not necessarily always in a bad way. I think it's worthwhile to remember um, that a great deal of um, inventions have come about as a result of uh, of warfare. That way in which the human mind is concentrated entirely on uh, on trying to win victory does mean that people in their different spheres all put their best into it. And uh, also the other thing that happens sometimes during war is that nations become more efficient at just concentrating on, on getting things done as opposed to sitting around in committees and and waiting for years uh, and not directing resources and so on. So although obviously it is the most appalling, monstrous evil that can can descend, nonetheless, I think we ought to recognize that it has in the past been a progressive force occasionally as well. And and a force that has changed history and changed politics in ways most people don't recognize. On both sides of the Atlantic, in Great Britain and in the United States, We can now look back and see that the consolidation of government and the reach of government into everyday lives of ordinary citizens really came uh, in both nations after 
World War I. And especially in Great yes, Britain. That's right. Yes. There's, a, there's a fascinating passage um, by the historian A.J.P. Taylor at the opening of his book, uh, England 1914 to 45, in which he points out that a, uh, a sort of freeborn Englishman, a normal, ordinary Englishman, um, could go about his life without having any influence from or connection with the state. Um, until the First World War broke out, he didn't need a passport. To, uh, to visit any other foreign country, uh, apart from an incredibly low taxation, something like 3 to 5%, um, the state really did not impose in his life at all. Um, and, uh, and now, of course, it's, uh, it's a incredibly, um, almost overpowering force in every aspect. Yes. Now, in your book on leadership and war, you dedicate chapters to Napoleon Bonaparte, Horatio Nelson, Winston Churchill, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, George C. Marshall, Charles de Gaulle, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, you look at them and you say, well, that's an interesting collection. Uh, what, what, at least in part, I think would be surprising, and if not shocking to some people, is that, uh, that Hitler is, is there on that list as well. But I think uh, oh, and, and Stalin, of course, yes, you know, uh, together yes. those two really are the sort of, you know, Tweedledum and Tweedledee of totalitarianism. Right. No, uh, absolutely. The uh, yeah. evil figures in their own rights. But it uh, doesn't mean that they weren't extraordinarily um, impressive leaders at certain parts of their lives when they were followed by millions of people. And of course, in the very fact that they weren't Democrats, uh, actually meant that ultimately they were not as good leaders if, if they had been. Um, Hitler making error after error, blunder after blunder, and Stalin uh, fighting a war in such a way that 27 million Russians got killed um, with enormous inefficiencies and complete disregard for human life. And um, so that, that has to be factored in. They'd have done better if they were Democrats, but uh, you can't deny that they were immensely important um, leaders in the Second World War. Yes, and well, as a matter of fact, uh, one can't explain the 20th century without explaining how those two horrific personalities attracted so many millions of devotees uh, who were willing both to kill and to die for them. Yes, I go into that uh, into my, uh, in my chapters, um, the way in which they were able to uh, to use all the tentacles of the state. You were mentioning earlier about the power of the state. Had it not been for the power of the state in both fascist uh, Germany and Soviet Russia, there's simply no way that that uh, could have been done, really. The, uh, the way in which Hitler um, had the uh, propaganda arm of Nazi Germany was in itself invaluable, the way in which he could create massive rallies by uh, the work of Albert Speer and the, and the uh, Lenny Riefenstahl's movies um, and so on. These things were, um, were absolutely uh, cutting edge at that time and, uh, of course, unbelievably destructive. So one of the things I argue in the preface of the book is that leadership is not naturally and in and of itself a good thing. It is like um, nuclear fission, you know, it can be used for good as well as for evil. And is, uh, you know, not only in history, but also uh, very much so in the present. But you have to begin somewhere. And, and so as you begin the series of, uh, of lives, chapter length considerations of leadership in war, uh, you begin with Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, I want to ask you a, a, a couple of questions related to this. Number one, is that where you would really date the beginning of, of modern warfare? Would you, would you look to Napoleon and say that Napoleon's campaigns uh, were, were the beginning of war in a continuous narrative of modern war? I wouldn't really, no. I think actually that, uh, that starts in, in your continent uh, with the American uh, Civil War. I think when you look at the importance of, um, of the machine gun and uh, trains, mass transit, um, the uh, uh, use of trenches and barbed wire and so on, um, uh, all essential for 20th century war, certainly. Uh, you see it first in all, all of those cases you see in the United States. But the reason that I started with Napoleon, apart from the fact that I'd written a big book about Napoleon and felt I had something useful to, um, to say about him, is that he did encompass so many of the prerequisites of 
leadership. Um, the end of that chapter, there's a paragraph in which I list uh, 20 important aspects of, uh, of leadership. And it struck me that Napoleon uh, encapsulated all of them, which is in itself very interesting, of course, because um, he lost. Uh, the uh, the fact that you're a can be a, a great leader as Napoleon was does not necessarily mean that you're going ultimately to be victorious. Well, there's so many moral lessons that uh, have been drawn from the the historical example of someone like a Napoleon, and and one of them is the fact that uh, one can be brilliant on the field, and uh, and many do date kind of modern warfare from uh, Napoleon because of his strategic grasp of massive. Uh, land armies uh, that could uh, basically uh, dominate an entire continent. And, and if he'd been satisfied in one sense, uh, the history might be very different and we might be talking about a very long Napoleonic age. But the other moral lesson about Napoleon is simply the fact that uh, he could not rest without invading Russia. And uh, that's never been a good plan. And uh, but had that not happened, there's every reason to argue that Napoleon could have sustained his uh, his, his rule as emperor for decades. Yes, absolutely. And then, of course, passed on to his uh, to his mm -hmm. son, the King of Rome. And subsequently, um, if the King of Rome had died in 1832 of tuberculosis, as he did, and then on to Napoleon III uh, in a very different Europe. So, I mean, there's there's absolutely no reason why. Um, why there couldn't have been a Bonaparte on the throne of France today, uh, for example, um, if he hadn't invaded Russia. But I think one of the things you have to remember when looking at that invasion of Russia is that it's not as insane as it seems to be in retrospect or as it's made out to be in, uh, in War and Peace and pretty much every other history book. Actually, he had an army twice the size of uh, Russia's. He invaded with 615,000 men, which was the same size as Paris at the time. He defeated the Russians twice before. Um, the, he only in, intended to go about 50 miles into Russia in a three-week campaign. He never intended to go all the way to Moscow, for example. And of course, he didn't know about typhus, which was the thing that killed um, one third of his troops. So all in all, um, it wasn't such an insane uh, gamble and a hubristic adventure as it's um it seems to be in retrospect about napoleon in particular uh and i enjoyed your uh, uh debate of sorts with adam zamoyski over uh, whether or not napoleon should be recognized as napoleon the great and uh we've uh, i've discussed just about all of your books with you on this program i also did a thinking in public with uh mr zamoyski on uh, on his work on napoleon but uh, and, and, and the debate was fascinating to watch. It was a bit lighthearted, uh, not so academic, but there were some serious ideas exchanged back and forth. And I've commended that uh, that debate to many. But one of the well, you must have commended it to quite a few, because I just uh, I was just told yesterday that five hundred and forty four thousand people have watched it over half a million people. That is pretty amazing. I, and I, I have you know, recommended it. A big ding dong. Yeah. <laughs> I've recommended it on this program. So I'll take credit for at least part of that. But uh, a, a part of, the, of, of the, the, the dynamism of that exchange is, uh, is just over whether Napoleon is to be judged as a colossal failure in the end or as someone who actually did change the face of, of not only France, but much of Europe. And uh, you, you argued for the latter. And uh, so, you know, in, in a sense, that also explains why Napoleon begins your book, because you think he has lasting influence. I do. Yes, I can't, you can't understand modern France without uh, appreciating the influence of Napoleon. It strikes me. I uh, can hardly walk down the street uh, in Paris without, uh, without spotting him in some way or another. Um, the concepts of equality before the law and uh, religious toleration and so on um, are revolutionary concepts, the French Revolution, but nonetheless, I mean, of course, they existed in, uh, in America 20 years before that, but in terms of Europe, they were revolutionary concepts. You, uh, uh, for the last thousand years of French history before then, you were um, judged upon who your uh, father and grandfather were. That was where your rank and status in society came from. Um, and uh, Napoleon ensured that um, it was replaced with meritocracy. 
And that is something that uh, a lot of people did not want to happen. And one of the reasons that uh, he was brought down was that he had to fight seven coalitions. Um, and, uh, and that was because the powers of Europe, powers like Prussia and Russia and Austria, to a lesser extent Britain, um, did not believe in this kind of meritocracy and in fact wanted to extinguish it. Yes, and thought they had. But Napoleon ended up winning the argument. Uh, it took uh, basically the Franco-Prussian War and then uh, World War I to make that argument as convincingly as it should have been understood. But nonetheless, uh, by the time you do get to World War II, there is at least an understanding that in theory, even military leadership ought to be uh, based upon a meritocracy, not upon titled nobility or upon uh, a gentry. But uh, old ideas die long deaths. Of course, that's right. And actually, when you look at the um, the military leaders of the First World War, uh, in not so much in France, but certainly in, in Britain and in Germany, um, you see the aristocracy still very much, um, or the squirearchy at least, still very much uh, in control. The uh, officer corps of the Prussians and, uh, and indeed the British high command uh, tended to be uh, people who came from the upper middle all the upper classes. Um, that doesn't mean they're bad soldiers, by the way, of course. But both of those classes have uh, produced extraordinarily impressive uh, leaders, and, and several of them are in my book, like uh, uh, like Napoleon and, and uh, um, Wellington came from the upper classes, uh, Winston Churchill came from the upper classes. So I'm, I'm absolutely not uh, suggesting they don't make good leaders, but it's so much more impressive, isn't it, by the time of the Second World War, when... Um, when George Marshall can can choose from a much wider um, uh, gene pool, as it were, than uh, than just the aristocracy. Which, by the way, he had largely built up when they were at the rank of major. And uh, George C. Marshall had had enormous uh, impact on them as younger men. Uh, when, when at that point, quite frankly, there was very little hope for serious promotion within the American army. Uh, all that changed. Yes, and a lot of people like D Dwight Eisenhower, of course, had to stay for very long time yes. in the sub-general rank um, uh, for, um, for the obvious reason that, uh, uh, that there were an awful lot of um, people who were superior to him. And the army itself rank. was quite small and, and politically kept small. Uh, one of the... Uh, Tiny. I mean, 200,000 yeah. people. When, when, when mm -hmm. the Second World War breaks out, your army is fewer than 200,000. It's the 16th largest army in the world, same size as uh, Romania. And so when you look at that capacity, the way in which George Marshall was able to um, make it 80 times bigger by the time the uh, war, Second World War ended, just the sheer, uh, to grasp that kind of, um, of uh, enormous expansion required a, uh, a really hugely impressive administrative and organizational brain. Right. The American uh, army was uh, fairly close in size to the army of Portugal uh, at the beginning of the war. You know, as, uh, as you think about this, uh, by the way, one of the things that, uh, that I think is a great advantage about chapter length uh, biographical studies is that you really have to concentrate your mind. And you've done that very much uh, in evidence in this book. You're, you're clearly concentrating the mind on Napoleon and Churchill and, and Hitler, and you just go down the list all the way down to Margaret Thatcher. And, and you have to make judgments, and you also have to provide insights. But for several of these, you've written, you know, 900-page biographies, and now you've got to reduce it to this. But what I found interesting in leadership in warfare is the fact that uh, you, you actually, I don't even know if you connected this in your own mind, but you, you actually bring out some character traits of leadership that end up being points of contrast. For instance, and I don't know if you were conscious of this when you were writing it, but you make the point that Adolf Hitler was lazy, extraordinarily lazy, and uh, just in terms of his workday. On the other hand, Napoleon was basically a workaholic, we might say. He, was, he, had, he had what you call an extraordinary capacity for work. And, uh, you know, you just think about it, you realize that... Uh, Observers of both of those men certainly must have noted those traits, but uh, there's some there's somehow an alchemy, isn't there? A, a combination of traits that uh, produces the reason why these individuals end up in an entire chapter of your book. Some one very lazy, one um, 
with an incredible work capacity. But they both well, they both end I, up. Here. I would say I would say that Hitler is the only one of those nine who are lazy. Margaret Thatcher famously only Absolutely. slept four hours uh, in every twenty-four. Uh, George Marshall, who we mentioned earlier, um, worked to sixteen-hour days on a regular basis. So did um, Dwight Eisenhower. You know, actually, um, although Winston Churchill took a forty-five-minute nap every afternoon, that was in order so that he could stay up until three o'clock in the morning working. So these people are, uh, except for um, for Hitler, they they are pretty much um, workaholics, as you said. Well, and I understand that. I think leadership really demands that, and I think that that when it's absent, then it must be explained. And uh, pondering this uh, from my own historical uh, interest in these figures, it seems to me that uh, Hitler uh, is an outlier in so many ways. He's almost difficult to uh, to put alongside others, including uh, the others in this book. He, I mean, certainly in terms of his influence, again, the questions raised by how he could have such power over so many millions, and especially in war, he, he deserves a place here, but he is an outlier in so many ways. Let, let me, if I may, just kind of walk through uh, some of these chapters, uh, because I, I think even the following of the chapters, the consequence of them, you, you go to Horatio Nelson, you actually need to make the, the, the point that Horatio Nelson is the greatest war hero uh, of British history, which is quite a thing to say. Uh, and I, I wondered if later, when you got to Churchill, you would put Churchill in the same category, although not on the battlefield as as Nelson was. But you also point all the way to his death and uh, and and you know statements that he had made even earlier when he said, you know, either I shall uh, I shall be in Westminster Abbey, uh, which meant dead, uh, or uh, a titled peer. Um, he understood what was at stake, but he personalized war. I guess that's what I want to ask you. Uh, you know, to the extent that you have a Horatio Nelson, who uh, I grew up admiring as a boy and, and still do, uh, to what extent would he have been a leader in any context other than war? Oh, I think he would have been, actually. I think he would have mm -hmm. made a great um, uh, takeover tycoon oh. uh, in, the, <laughs> uh, in the world of business. Uh, his his uh, strategy was attack, attack, attack. Uh, he was just um, constantly um, active. And that was um, something which, of course, worked immensely well in the age of fighting sale, when he had um, the capacity to pour two broadsides into an enemy vessel, either French or Spanish, uh, in the same time that it took them to fire one back because of the training that he had, uh, he had insisted on from his, uh, from his sailors. Um, but his uh, his strategy, his tactics, at least, um, were to um, were to take advantage of this uh, this great advantage over the French and Spanish by attacking constantly. And I think uh, I think you could see him in in lots of uh, other areas besides um, besides the age of fighting sail. But there really were no capitalist takeover artists in the age of Horatio Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry. He's got to stay in his own century, has he? Oh, yes. well, fine. In that case, no, no, you're quite right. I, uh, I mean, he uh, he wouldn't have done so well on land, uh, where the British Army wasn't able to um, to fire twice as fast as the uh, as the French. Um, he wouldn't have done as well, pretty much, in politics either. Um, he was um, uh, extreme, extreme reactionary, uh, pro slavery. A, uh, he was not a good man when it came to his um, to his political views, and those I think would have caught up with him for too long. Um, his father, of course, was a was a vicar, was a was a um, somebody in the Church of uh, England. I can't see him ever getting very far uh, as a uh, uh, as a priest either. So um, I think we're we're pretty lucky that uh, poor old Nelson, at the age of twelve years old, was sent off to uh, to the Royal Navy as a midshipman. When you uh, look at someone like Horatio Nelson, you look at, at a name, I mean, there at Trafalgar Square, there he is on that uh, enormously uh, elevated column. And to people in Britain today, is Horatio Nelson at all a part of the living imagination? Or, or if so, among whom? Less and less, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, there have been people who've uh, wanted to have him pulled off the column on, uh, on uh, Nelson's uh, column in Trafalgar Square because of the uh, views that I mentioned earlier, his uh, 
his pro-slavery um, views. Um, it's, uh, he's not really taught terribly much um, as a hero. And in fact, he was a, a question. Uh, we, we, when we have our uh, uh, people who, who become British through immigration, they, um, they get taught various things about British history. And he was, you know, who is the hero on the top of uh, the column in Trafalgar Square one, was one of the questions. And they're thinking of, of, of getting rid of that because it's uh, considered to be too um, militaristic. Um, so I'm afraid, no, Nelson is, uh, he's, he's being sort of uh, downgraded and uh, not quite cancelled, but, uh, but, you know, his, um, uh, he's, he's a marked man, unfortunately. Well, I am not only one with an intense historical and theological interest, I am also an Anglophile. But I will say that if London seeks to remove all militaristic imagery, you're going to have a naked city. Uh, of course. No, no, no. And, and, we, and, we, and we won't, you know, but we just have to have a little bit more leadership, I think. Um, when uh, the statue of Winston Churchill and indeed our cenotaph in, in Whitehall, the uh, the, the monument to the to the dead of the First World War and the Second World War. Both of those things were uh, spray painted and vandalised recently in a in a demonstration, and the police stood around and did nothing about it. and uh, And it's uh, it's infuriating, really, and uh, and also very depressing to think that we have got to the stage where we're unable to stand up for our heroes and our values in the way that we ought to. Right. You know, I think uh, uh, London and Washington, but London more than Washington because of the tragedies of war and a longer history of war, but in particular, even looking at the, uh, at, at the First World War and the massive loss of, uh, of what uh, Churchill would have called British manhood uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to that horrible war. Uh, the commemoration of that war is so much a part of national identity. It just it just seems to me that uh, trying in any way to desecrate or to erase that means that you you just have blank tape. Uh, it uh, it doesn't make historical sense. It doesn't even serve the moral purposes of the present. Precisely, and and actually, the another thing that we're seeing a bit of at the moment, uh, which is awful, is uh, is not so much mocking um, the uh, the great. Um, uh, services for the dead as to hijack them. Um, in, uh, in London on um, uh, the 11th, just a few days ago, at the time of the Remembrance um, Day uh, ceremony in, uh, in Whitehall, the um, Extinction Rebellion um, environmentalist uh, activists uh, staged their own attempted um, Remembrance Day service for the planet. And, uh, you know, it's not the right time to do something like that. It's just, it jars terribly with the um, now 100-year-old ceremony for the dead of the, of the Great War and the Second World War and subsequent wars. Well, it also shows tragically and Im immorally the luxury of people who did not have to fight in those wars and do not have to take any moral stance uh, about what was at stake in those wars. But the only reason that they can do what they did, abhorrently enough, is because uh, Britain and the Allies were victorious in those wars. Precisely, yes. Poli you're, you're essentially politicizing something uh, yes. and taking advantage of the fact that you do have free speech, which, had it not been for the people who everybody else is trying to memorialize at the time, uh, you wouldn't have. I mean, there's simply no way if the Germans had won either the First World War, or certainly the Second World War, that we would have had anything like free speech in this country, uh, a sp free speech which ought to be treated um, respectfully and, and not uh, abused in the way that it was just the other day and, and will be again, frankly. You know, this, uh, uh, this is an ongoing struggle, the cultural struggle in Britain at the moment. Well, and on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, but you cross history here. You uh, you end your chapter on Nelson by referring to him citing uh, Emma Hamilton as the as Nelson as the uh, guardian angel of England. But, but then you fast forward to Winston Churchill, and uh, so you're you're skipping a lot of territory there. But on the other hand, with Winston Churchill, you've got uh, you've got everything from the Victorian age uh, into the reign of Elizabeth II. So you can actually cover about. Uh, well, 
half the modern age with uh, with Winston Churchill. It's amazing, isn't it? You know, he took part in the last great cavalry charge of the British Empire. So you tie him in, therefore, with the British Empire as he's uh, as he's charging with a sword and a and a, a pistol, and um, and then you fast forward through, and he's prime minister at the time that we have the nuclear bomb. Um, so uh, so yes, he he does sort of straddle the uh, um, the the whole gamut of warfare uh, like a colossus. I've been fascinated with Churchill since I was 13 years old. And uh, in my study, there, there are three oil portraits of Churchill, as a matter of fact, uh, along with many others, uh, most of them theological. But, uh, but Churchill is there because he has been a, a, a focus of fascination for me. And, uh, and, and not just a matter of historical interest, but a, a matter of the formation of, uh, of worldview and understanding of leadership. And, uh, and, and Churchill was such a man of parts. It's difficult to imagine how you could write a chapter on him. I, I, I did that myself. But to, uh, to compress Churchill down into just a few thousand words is an enormous challenge. But it's also a, a joy. I mean, you're talking about someone who, unlike several of the others you're talking about here, was, uh, was, uh, was let's put it this way, was, was able to smile while he raised the victory sign in the smoldering ruins of, of a blitz and bombing, someone who uh, did indeed uh, work with uh, maps and strategy and brilliantly so with his generals and admirals until three in the morning, but someone who did also uh, consume an enormous, and for a Baptist, this is a, just an historical note, uh, it consumed an enormous amount of champagne at the same time. He appears to me to stand out from these others in the fact that uh, Churchill, a uh, far more, I would argue, than someone like Nelson, was indeed going to dominate his age one way or the other. Yes, uh, I, I mean, mm -hmm. he was very lucky again and again. I, I think um, had um, he not uh, resigned over the, or been forced to resign at least, over the Gallipoli campaign and then gone into the trenches and served in the First World War uh, on, the, uh, on the sort of dangerous end of the First World War in the Western Front uh, trenches. Um, that might have damaged his career um, extremely badly because, of course, he had made these uh, the blunders in, uh, in the Dardanelles, uh, well-intentioned, and it could have come off, but it didn't, and it led to the... Uh, it the, wasn't a stupid idea. It, no, it, it wasn't just, a stupid but it was idea. carried it was, off it was stupidly. It was a brilliant yes. idea to have to have got the Royal Navy through the Straits of the Dardanelles and to have moored it off Istanbul, modern day Istanbul, then Constantinople. You'd have taken the Ottoman Empire out of the Great War. It would have been one of the great strategic coups in the history of warfare. But um, because of the way it was organised on the 18th of March 1915, we lost six ships trying to get through. Uh, if we'd done it earlier, if we had uh, done it slightly differently, it wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't have happened. And so it wasn't a bad idea. It was just, he was tremendously unlucky. And that could have knocked him out. You know, that could have taken him out and he could have just spent the rest of his uh, career painting or, or writing books or, or so on. But um, uh, so I don't think we can assume that he would always have been in the forefront at all, all times. Well, he thought he would, you know, even as a 16 year old, he's telling his uh, friends of this vision he has in which he alone is going to save England, uh, which could not make you very popular it's as amazing, a 16 isn't it? year old. Yes, he tells his best friend when they're at school, he's a schoolboy at Harrow School, uh, that there shall be great upheavals and terrible struggles in our lives and that I shall be called upon to save England and uh, save London and save the empire. And then half a century later, that that does happen. But for that to have happened, um, it required him to go off and put his life on the line in the trenches of the, yes. of the First World War. Yes, and you talk about, uh, you know, you said he was lucky. Uh, I'll just say providentially, it was not uh, without note that he was born as the uh, first son of the second son of the Duke of Marlborough. Uh, and I've been to Blenheim more than once, and I can just, you know, you, you just, you're there and you realize any baby born here is, uh, is going to have a, a certain sense of historical destiny that another baby <laughs> is likely never to have. 
<laughs> yes, I, uh, I've, I've um, just had the honour of being appointed to the Blenheim, a, a trustee of the Blenheim Palace Foundation. And, uh, and I have to say, I can't go through those, those gates, those extraordinary gates, uh, uh, without, um, without thinking, gosh, what a total megalomaniac I'd have been if I was born here. <laughs> no, I, I, I will tell you, I had the same thought. Uh, but my other thought was, I'll just say, since I, uh, I've, I had an opportunity to speak to someone who's a member of the board of the trust, please do not desecrate uh, Blenheim Palace with the uh, modern art, the display that was there when I was there a matter of months ago. You know, you know what they had last year? They had a, 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 <laughs> they had, speaking again on a, on a uh, Baptist uh, show, a, a lavatory, a gold plated lavatory. Stolen days before I was there. Did you know? You, yes. Did you not see this? I'm, I'm pleased about that. Anyhow, it, well, nobody sees it now because it had two million pounds worth of gold uh, on it and um, somebody stole it. Uh, now, I, I just will tell you that walking through Blenheim Palace and understanding what that meant and seeing uh, a dead horse hanging from the ceiling as a supposed demonstration of modern art and other things, uh, including an assassinated pope that just led me to say this is what happens when uh, an empire no longer believes in itself but i will leave that to you and other members of the trust to adjudicate uh, going forward i'm not going to say a word on this issue yeah uh you go from from churchill to hitler and uh, that is jarring uh but nonetheless historically it's explicable and uh, you begin by saying any understanding of adolf hitler has to begin by acknowledging the fact that he was extravagantly admired and even worshiped by millions of normal people for more than a decade. Now, that leads me to wonder, using the careful prose that, uh, that you employed in that sentence, would you use the word worshipped of any other of the uh, leaders here? Uh, I mean, I can think of one you might, but, but Stalin. not necessarily. Stalin, Stalin yes. you would as well. Yes. Uh, when, you, when you think that there are still people, even today in Russia, who um, admire Stalin and look up to him, I think he was a great, uh, great man, even though they know perfectly well who was responsible for the Ukraine famine and the Katyn massacres and the uh, six million or so people who died in the um, Gulag. There too, you you can no longer see this as just a, a political decision. This is this unfortunately goes into the whole area of um, of uh, religion. Yes. You know, that, that I, I think theologically, you're exactly right. And, uh, and both of them had an iconography. They had a cult. Uh, they had effective state worship uh, one way or another. And of course, they had heretics and they had uh, heresy trials, so to speak. And, and uh, Mein Kampf was a, was a Bible, just as uh, some of Stalin's works on Leninism were as well. No, you, you see the whole, uh, the whole gamut of the, of the sort of Catholic 16th century uh, Inquisition at work in, in both of those um, countries, uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. You know, it reminds me of that great paragraph in The, the Last Lion by uh, William Manchester, in which he says, uh, it's that great paragraph in, in which he ends by saying in London, there was such a man. Uh, but it, it, it mentions that what would be necessary for England to survive would be someone who could rally uh, the English people the way the Hitler rallied the German people, but without a cult of self-worship. Precisely. And also uh, to appear, to appeal, sorry, to the best in human nature rather than the worst. Uh, Churchill was appealing to emotions that we should be proud of. Whereas Hitler, of course, with his rage and resentment, his racism, uh, his anti-Semitism and so on, was appealing to the, to the lowest uh, in human nature. Now, one of the issues that, uh, that you raise with reference to Hitler is the fact that he, in one sense, defeated himself. And, uh, and that was by the fact that he evidently was so committed to his ideology that he allowed his ideology to subvert his war aims. And I, I think there are a lot of people who don't, uh, who don't reach that insight about Hitler and uh, in, in that the, the ideology is central to the man. It's, in, it's uh, inseparable so central to him that it leads him on to make the greatest strategic error of his uh, life, or at least a couple of them. Um, the first, of course, was to invade Russia in June 1941. Uh, the thing that impelled Operation Barbarossa was not strategy. It was um, Nazism. Uh, 
He wanted to have what he called a final reckoning with the Bolsheviks, who he'd been denouncing on street corners since the 1920s. He wanted Lebensraum uh, for his so-called master race, again, an essentially a, a Nazi concept. And of course, he also wanted to annihilate the Jews, um, over 50% of whom lived uh, in Russia in 1941. Um, so these things are, are driven by his politics and not by grand strategy. And then the mistake that he made six months later was to declare war against uh, the United States, an uninvadable country uh, that he, he simply couldn't uh, truly uh, damage. And he did this again because he, uh, he thought that uh, American democracy was by its very nature weak and would be unable to, uh, to respond effectively. And so this is, um, this is his Nazi ideology. You see it in lots of other areas uh, too, um, actually impelling him towards what ultimately, of course, was to be his and Germany's doom. And you cannot uh, fail to also mention here the uh, the final solution, the energies, the horrifying, unspeakably evil energies of the Nazi regime driven by Hitler uh, in the elimination of European Jewry, which uh, actually, in, in many ways, fatally undermined his own war effort in two ways, uh, by directing so much energy towards the annihilation of the Jews. And secondly, he destroyed uh, literally millions of people he could have put to work in, in the war effort. And not just normal people, you know, um, the, the, the most highly intelligent and uh, hardworking and well-educated people in German society. Uh, so, yes, as you say, I go into this actually in some detail in my book, uh, Storm of War, um, published um, about 10 years ago or so, and, and look at the, uh, the way in which through the Holocaust, but also uh, through all these other um, ways that he put his ideology before Germany's best interests, best military interests, um, that he, he managed to, uh, um, as, as you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, uh, to undermine his chances, really. We have to move from Hitler to Stalin, and you do so in the book. And uh, I think, uh, uh, honestly, most people in the West alive today in 2020 uh, have at least some mental referent for Adolf Hitler, but I think fewer and fewer have a mental referent for Joseph Stalin. And uh, yet Stalin was as consequential in world history as, uh, as Adolf Hitler was, and perhaps more so considering the length of his reign and the continuation of his regime uh, long after Stalin's own death. That's right, yes. And, uh, and ultimately, it's a... Um... Ultimately, it's an incredibly um, tragic story, isn't it, that one of these terrible dictators should have been able uh, to, uh, to be uh, killed in 1945, and the other one, unfortunately, is allowed to carry on for another eight years, um, tyrannizing his own country and then extending, attempting to extend communism, um, Soviet communism, a truly evil totalitarian concept other parts of the world, especially, of course, Eastern Europe. And, uh, and so, yes, it's, um, it's also one of the, the difficult moral issues, really, that we only won the Second World War because um, the German army was, uh, was destroyed in Russia. It wasn't destroyed by the British and the Americans and Canadians and French and the rest of the people in Western Europe. Uh, for every five Germans killed in combat during the Second World War, four died on the Eastern Front. Um, so we have to somehow get our minds around the fact that uh, although we did win the Second World War, it was only with the help of a tyrant uh, who was, uh, to all intents and purposes, as bad as the one we were destroying. Well, you know, about uh, 20 years after the end of the Second World War, historians began to raise uh, some basic questions about this, and uh, we could go through a bibliography here, but one of the most uh, 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 humbling assessments was that uh, perhaps only a regime like the Soviet regime under Stalin in Russia could be as ruthless uh, and as, uh, as, how can I put this, as... Uh, as callous in the death of their own people as Stalin was to absorb that kind of violence in, in order to uh, allow the German army to be spent out 
in places such as Stalingrad. Uh, no, no democratic regime would be likely to survive that kind of test. I, I used to believe that, um, but I, I slightly wonder whether that is true now. I think that if Britain had been invaded by the Nazis in 1940, I think Churchill would have been able to have um, told us that we needed to carry on fighting to the death in the way that um, Stalin, of course, with, with him it was just orders. Um, he killed the equivalent of an entire division uh, at Stalingrad. The NKVD would shoot anybody who um, who retreated, and um, that led to over fourteen thousand people being shot. And um, they would have to charge into German machine gun fire without weapons, you know, in the hope that they would be able to pick up the weapons of the dead person in front of them. And this is extraordinary stuff. But nonetheless, I wonder whether or not when you're fighting for your hearth and home and when you're encouraged by somebody like Winston Churchill, um, that, um, that we wouldn't have also been able to have undergone appalling um, and extreme um, circumstances like that. But that assumes that there would have been a war. But uh, your own historical work uh, in several different of your books points to the fact that the appeasement class was uh, such a powerful threat that... Uh, uh, but for Winston Churchill and others uh, such as he, uh, it might never have gotten to that. I think one of the most amazing questions to me, and, and it's, it's one that we don't even have time really to trace out here, but uh, the fact is that even after Winston Churchill becomes prime minister, he's still being undercut by Halifax and others. Uh, yes, I do uh, go into that a bit yes. in my biography of Winston Churchill, the, yes. the, the uh, Walking with Destiny that we spoke about uh, a few months ago. Uh, and you're right. but. But actually, uh, one of the extraordinary things about him was that there were so few others who were saying the same thing. And usually in, in politics, you have a few people who, uh, who stick their necks out. Other than Winston Churchill, it's very difficult to think of anyone, um, in, uh, not just in Britain, but, but in the West, really, who, uh, who denounced Hitler and, uh, and demanded high uh, defense spending and uh, and opposed him right from the beginning it's a it's a, a sorry tale really and there are uh, there are no ways to track actually counterfactuals in history i know you've edited a book about what might have been uh, yeah. but the fact is as intellectually stimulating and curious as that is you really don't know but it's it's certainly i think uh, true i'll go back to the point i made that when you look at the united states in world war 2 it would be very difficult to imagine a democratically elected uh, government here surviving uh, anything like the military losses that uh, that the Soviet Union had uh, had had experienced when the war was not understood to affect the American continental mainland, and so the United States was in a different position. Well, that's that's because you're lucky enough to have a three thousand mile ocean. <laughs> Between you and, Providentially the, uh, enough. and the Nazis, yes, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, but but that it, that enabled America to uh, to be uh, to suffer under uh, uh, illusions uh, such that we had an army about the size of Portugal as World War II's beginning in Europe. Uh, it, it, that's not envisionable now. We're looking at a different world order, and and that takes us to the continuation of your book. You go from Joseph Stalin to George C. Marshall, and Marshall becomes a bridge figure. Uh, not only between, say, World War I and World War II, uh, and he's absolutely instrumental to World War II in ways he doesn't often get credit for. And, and, and then also as uh, Secretary of State uh, after the war, he, uh, he has a leading role in rebuilding the very Europe uh, over which he had uh, supervised war. Yes, he was a giant, wasn't he? I mean, a, a truly extraordinary figure. Um, the Marshall Plan saved um, Europe, I believe, or at least large, large wadges of it, including probably the whole of Italy, from communism, um, maybe even France. It was uh, absolutely essential that the European economies be rebuilt as soon as possible after the war, and that couldn't have been done without uh, American, massive American financial um, aid, which, of course, ultimately was repaid because it meant that not not uh, financially repaid, but ultimately repaid because uh, it meant that you had people who were going to be able to buy your products. So, you know, it was a, a very 
broad-minded and uh, far-sighted economic um, uh, action as well as uh, as well as a political action. It's one of the most selfless moments, really. Um, and ultimately, it uh, I'm very really pleased to say managed to uh, managed to work. Can you imagine a, a, a Europe in which France and Italy had uh, had fallen to um, to communism? Right. Looked at from an American perspective, it represents a high watermark of bipartisan government in the United States in the aftermath of the war. The Marshall Plan was only possible because Democrats and Republicans were willing uh, to uh, to spend more money than the United States had even collected in many previous years uh, in taxes, and to uh, devote it to the rebuilding of a war-ravaged continent, and especially Western Europe, in such a way that it would uh, reestablish uh, civilization. It was broad-minded. It was also in the national interest of the United States, but that was a near-run thing. Uh, I mean, it, it, it only is recognized as being in the national interest of the United States because it effectively worked. Uh, well, that's right. And yes. can you imagine, you know, you're a senator in 1940. Nine, um, 1948, say, and somebody comes to you and says that um, America must take on these huge debts in order to um, give money to foreign countries. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, an easy sell politically. That, um, and uh, and yet the um, uh, the leadership was so uh, broad-minded that they were able to do that. I see it as as almost as important as the Germany first policy that the Roosevelt administration adopted um, in 1941, you know, whereby they decided they were going to attack Germany before um, Japan. That, too, required uh, uh, extraordinary statesmanship to sell to to people, but um, but they managed it. I just gave recently a major address on Dwight Eisenhower. And uh, he's a far more interesting figure than most people think of him as uh, as being. But uh, he's another one who in the United States is receding into the imagination, partly because uh, the Cold War has disappeared from American consciousness. And uh, and so the uh, the continued uh, leadership of Dwight Eisenhower after the war becomes something of a footnote now. Yes, um, how sad and tragic that is. You know, one of your great presidents, um, president at a time when America was at its most powerful, um, really, the 1950s, uh, and a good president and a very, very fine man. Uh, and if you're starting to forget people like Dwight Eisenhower, then that does not um, bode well for, um, for the American future. No, we recently, uh, finally, after decades of controversy, dedicated the Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, D.C. And, it, and it's not the atrocity it almost was, but it's still an atrocity. Uh, we, can't, we can't connect. We're just unwilling. We don't have the moral fiber anymore to connect our own leaders with classical models of leadership. Now we have to make them... Um, we, have to, we have to cut them down to size, so to speak. But when you're talking about the achievements of someone like a Dwight Eisenhower, you really can't cut them down to size. So it ends up being this remarkably out of scale uh, Eisenhower with this monumental uh, modern recreation of the uh, of of the the Normandy cliffs, and it, it it's just you look at it and you go, we're a, we're a we're not the civilization we once were. That's for, that's for certain. As you think of uh, two others in your book. And Margaret Thatcher's been uh, another fascination to me ever since, because I was a very young man when she came to power, and I was absolutely fascinated by her. I had the opportunity to meet her and, and actually talk with her at length. Uh, my favorite photograph in my uh, study is of, uh, is of my wife and I visiting with Lady uh, Baroness Thatcher at the time. And, uh, you know, I, I, I continue to believe that there is still a possibility for convictional leadership. Uh, on the world stage. And I, I still believe that Margaret Thatcher was a convictional leader. I hold her up as a model of convictional leadership. Leadership. She had certain ideas that she represented, and she represented them to the very end. That's so right. Yes, exactly. I mean, my country was, uh, was in the danger of uh, slipping down to being a third-rate power in 1979 uh, when she came to power. We had the most terrible systemic uh, issues and and problems and uh, and lack of leadership and lack of vision of whereabouts we wanted to be and uh, 
it was it was a bad time. I remember it personally. I was born in 1963, so I was uh, 16 when she became prime minister. I remember it extremely well. And then I got to know her. She came uh, to dinner several times here in my uh, in my house in London, and I went round the corner. She lived about 200 yards away from where I'm sitting now, and so uh, uh, so I knew her well. And um, she appointed me to take her place uh, on the Margaret Thatcher Archive Trust. And uh, so she sort of uh, is such an important figure in my in my overview of of uh, politics that I'm not for a moment pretending now to be uh, objective. I can't be about Margaret Thatcher. I'm entirely subjective. I think that she was a great woman, a uh, great states person, and somebody who effectively saved my country. So it's it's impossible really for me to be objective about her. No, and I appreciate that. I, 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 I share your admiration from across the sea. And, uh, and in and, that chapter, a, yeah. the, 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 mm-hmm. the, the choice, by the way, of her to be in, the, uh, in my book, Leadership in War, uh, is, is not down to the fact that I, I feel veneration for her, um, but down to the fact that she did fight this, uh, this war, the Falklands War, in a Churchillian way. You can you can hear the echoes and overtones in her speeches. You can see the way in which she uh, she got a small war cabinet that she um, empowered the admirals and so on. Uh, it um, the way she worked it politically in the House of Commons and uh, in the cab in the wider cabinet. You know this this was a woman who had read her Churchill and uh, was going to put it into effect. And you see it uh, extremely effectively in the Falcons conflict. And I think of her as something of an heir of Nelson uh, in the sense that I believe it is still true today in 2020 that uh, the, uh, the British naval action against Argentina in the Falcons War is the most distant uh, mobilization of naval forces in all of human history. Yes, yes, we were fighting 8,500 miles away or something totally extraordinary uh, like that, yes. Uh, the, the longest lines of communication of any, um, of any naval engagement. Well, and the other problem is that in the modern age with satellites and, and all the rest, there was no way that uh, the British Navy could uh, sneak up on Argentina. In other words, uh, everyone knew that that, uh, that naval force was headed to Argentina and uh, that afforded opportunity for negotiation. But of course, uh, the, uh, the Argentinian regime was not open to negotiation. That's right. Uh, when you look at Charles de Gaulle, uh, and, and he's become more of a, a figure of fascination to me as, at this stage in my life than he was when I was a boy, because he was certainly a part of the landscape, uh, de Gaulle and the Fifth Republic. Um, but he, he, to Americans, was always a difficult person to think about because he is basically uh, anti-American. Uh, of course, it turns out he was kind of anti-everybody but France. And, uh, you know, his own term about France is that, that, it, that France must have a certain idea about itself. He said, you know, he had a certain idea of France. And it seems to me that de Gaulle represents someone who nearly is absent from the world scene today, and that is the national leader who embodies the nation. Yes, that's true. Um, it's it's very difficult to um, to uh, see anyone like that. Perhaps you need a war uh, for an individual to embody a nation, in a democracy at least. And, and an existential uh, because, threat. Well, one of the things that uh, yes. um, that FDR and Churchill both worried about was whether or not Charles de Gaulle was a Democrat, uh, or whether or not he was a basically authoritarian figure, um, such as you saw in Eastern Europe in the 1930s, for example, again and again. Um, a kind of, of um, Admiral Haughty uh, figure, or of General Franco, perhaps, uh, that kind of uh, leader, which he was not. He was a Democrat. And of course, when he, uh, when he lost elections, he, he stood down. Um, but, uh, and it's not just that he was anti-American, he was anti-Anglo-Saxon, he was anti le roast beef. Uh, so he, he, he despised us in England just as much and thought that we were um, exactly the same thing, you know, uh, Anglo-Saxon cousins, who he, uh, he, he uh, needed to outmaneuver and to, um, and to split as much as possible uh, and to uh, 
and to beat. And uh, there's an extraordinary moment when he went off to visit the battlefields of um, of Russia. Um, and at one point, he says, what an extraordinary people, extraordinary people. And his private secretary recognizes that, in fact, he's talking about the Germans um, to have got as far as Stalingrad uh, rather than the Russians who, uh, who ultimately defeated them. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so you're right. Yes, there, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, a sort of um, uh, what's the equal opportunities um, contempt that uh, De Gaulle felt for everybody else. Well, a very morally complex figure, to be honest. Uh, you know, a, a, a very difficult figure to untangle. Uh, but uh, and that raises another question, which is, you know, how exactly is De Gaulle remembered in France today? Well, it, it totally depends on which part of um, the political spectrum you come from in, in France. Uh, he's admired by uh, Emmanuel Macron. Um, uh, he is, of course, followed by the, by the Gaullist right. Um, he's uh, interestingly despised by the National Front, the neo-fascist um, French politicians, because of what he did in Algeria, which was to, uh, to withdraw the French Empire from Algeria. And they hate him for that. In fact, uh, the National Front Party was created by people who had a, grown up opposing de Gaulle. Um, on the on the left, he is uh, um, also despised for having been an ultra conservative in in many ways. Although not actually all the time economically, um, he was he was a, a, a nationalist uh, economically. So he's a uh, he's a divisive figure. In uh, in one sense, although you know every Frenchman will agree, and I hope, um, and Winston Churchill agreed with this as well, and I and I certainly do. I'm sure you do too. That ultimately, when it came push came to shove against the Nazis, he was the man of destiny, and he was the person who saved the honor of France. Yes, even by fiction, but he did save the honor of France. Uh, you know, uh, marching into Paris as if the French had won the war. Uh, when they did no such thing. Uh, I think you point but, out less than 1% of the leaving, casualties I mean, were No, French. I'm thinking more in terms of saving the honour of France in, in uh, June 1940, leaving yes. France, yes. refusing to go along with the Pettinist uh, surrender, yes. um, coming to London to continue the war against the Germans. That's, that's when he saved the honour of France. Right. No, and I would agree with you on that. And also, he did so, uh, you know, at the, the cost. And again, you, you think about what's at stake. Uh, had de Gaulle been uh, unsuccessful, he would have been shot as a traitor uh, or worse. And so he, he put his life on the line, demonstrated personal courage as well. Every one of these figures is fascinating. I think every one of them is fully justified in the, the chapters of your book, Leadership in War, Essential Lessons from Those Who Made History. It's, it's another wonderful work, uh, Andrew. I really admire what you do. I, uh, I read all of your works, and I, 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 including ones we never had the opportunity to talk about on Salisbury and Halifax. Uh, and I want to thank you for the, the work you put into these, uh, these books and uh, then the evident joy that, uh, that you, you demonstrate in talking about them. This is not just a matter of uh, authorial interest to you. There's deeply a, a personal interest here. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yes, I don't. Um, I'm not one of those writers who thinks that when you uh, put the final full stop on the final page, then it's all done and you can just leave the rest of it to the publishers. I uh, uh, part of the great pleasure for me uh, about being a, a, a writer is um, is sharing it and uh, and talking to people about it and uh, and interacting with them um, and listening to their reactions to it. So um, thank you very much indeed. Albert, it's been a complete delight to be on the show. My next book is a biography of King George III, which is coming out this time next year. So uh, I'd uh, love to talk to you about that then. Well, uh, consider this uh, your first uh, invitation from a rebellious colonist uh, to uh, talk about uh, your biography on George III. I guarantee you I will, uh, I will consume it ravenously as soon as it gets to me and look forward to talking with you about it. Thank, Thank you very, again to uh, Andrew Roberts for joining me today for Thinking in Public. God bless you. Thank you.
Many thanks to my guest, Andrew Roberts, for thinking with me today. If you enjoyed this conversation, you'll find more than 100 of these as Thinking in Public episodes at albertmuller.com. Just go to the tab, Thinking in Public. I hope that you've enjoyed these conversations as much as I have. And uh, I'll tell you, there's nothing like reading a book and then having the opportunity to discuss the book with the author. For more information on the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, go to sbts.edu. For information on Boyce College, just go to boycecollege.com. I'll meet you again for Thinking in Public. And until then, keep thinking. I'm Albert Moeller. <music>